Hi, I'm Christy. And I'm Emma. In 2016, we launched the No Justice Project in partnership with Drake University's Middleton Center for Children's Rights. It has since then become an annual art exhibit highlighting our youth artists. This project aimed to show that youth in our judicial system, that their future is helpful and their life experiences and voices matter. No Justice gave youth their tools and opportunity to learn about their personal rights, contemplate their own participation in the justice system, and provided a healthy way to respond creatively through art. Using art to elevate the voices of court-involved youth, the No Justice Project engaged the public in a discourse around system disproportionality and social injustices these youth face. In 2017, we hosted no justice, finding home. You see, the Art Force Iowa community grew to include our heroes, young people who identify as immigrants, refugee, or first-generation American-born youth who are survivors of crime. We invited the community to explore new concepts of home through the eyes of young people who have seen more than most of us can even imagine. From witnessing and living in war-torn countries to fleeing genocide, from living day to day with all of their belongings in a trash bag, to not knowing when they'll have their next meal. With the help of Drake Law School students, our youth artists learn how to defend themselves, how to exercise their legal rights, how to express difficult thoughts and feelings, how to move through traumatic experiences and still welcome each new day as full of possibility. We have asked former youth artists to join us in reflecting on what this experience meant to them. Here's what they have to say. It was 2015 when I started Art Force. So I was 15 going on 16. When I got there, like the vibe, the initial vibe and just atmosphere, it felt very much like camp almost. And just really like family, like a home away from home. Everybody had so many different stories and backgrounds. And it just made me realize, like it put so much perspective on my life at the time. Being so young, I just didn't know so many people who went through so many different things so young to be at Art Force and just to hear everybody's story. And I just felt so honored to be a part of everybody being able to open up and just kind of find their outlet and do things that they typically would not do or have the space to do, let alone resources or just the safety or comfort to do. And I just felt so honored to be a part of that space. It just felt so much like family. Um, I got involved with Art Force Iowa in like around September of 2016. At that time, I think it was like after school, I was in eighth grade. Christine and another person came to um, Laurel where I was living at that time. And they were just recruiting people for the DSM Heroes program that they were starting up. Some of the program that they were offering was creative writing, uh, visual arts, but also a lot of instruments. And I was mostly interested in the instrument side. So I signed up for it and this will also give me something to do after school because I usually don't do anything. So that's how I got involved in the art course. So it was right across from North High School and it was adjacent to their playing fields. They had a, a track and football field and soccer field. And it was two floors. Uh, from the outside, it was kind of a futuristic looking building, very sleek. Mirrored, mirrored glass panels all the way to the top and bottom. I remember walking into the space for the first time with the former director and it being, I think, I think there was a whole office for like tool catalogs or some sort of machinery operations going on there. And then offices, which we ended up completely gutting and it gave a really real and open atmosphere to the space. Having two floors that was just kind of free range, arts happening everywhere, all kinds of arts all happening all the time. And basically all the walls were just adorned with art. Art that the kids had made, art that we had made, um, art that we found, you know, there was a lot of a lot of space to express yourself. People would be downstairs in the photo lab. Some people would have a laptop in the other room, editing in the same room as youth artists painting. And somebody might be playing the piano or the drums. Upstairs, people would be editing their music in a, like more of a soundproof area. And then also visual arts happening there. So it was just, a really transformative place for Art Force Iowa and a place where I think Art Force really um, began to 
grow and flower. That was back when we had Street Cred Studio. So they had a whole screen printing business back there. And that was a whole division of Art Force uh, that doesn't exist anymore, but it was a very good program. What's really fun about that space though is that it was so vast that, you know, if you were looking for somebody, you kind of had to like look around for them because there was always so much going on, so much energy just bouncing around the place. When I would work with younger artists, I think that a big part of Art Force's direction has always been that it's youth led and finding out how to work with a participant to execute their vision was really what I was always trying to do. Sometimes that ended up in work not being completed, which is part of the process, you know? And I think that's really what I would say about my approach is it's more process driven and it's less about a final outcome because once you get something in a gallery setting, it's gonna look amazing no matter what it is. We had these workshops where we'd have the kids in uh, after school for a couple hours and they would just hang out with us and kind of express themselves and give, we'd give them a space to feel safe to kind of do whatever they wanted. You know, we'd hang out, we'd go on these little nature walks and I'd kind of talk to them lightly about cameras because back then, you know, a lot of them were mostly interested in just taking pictures and having fun. Um, so it wasn't really so much as instructional workshops. It was more just like creative projects that I'd, I'd have them do. I just remember the preparation for the No Justice exhibits. It wasn't just like, what's home to you? I know the first initial theme was home and what that meant to everybody. And we kind of based our exhibits and our, our projects off of that. The preparation for it, we were doing seminars as far as our rights as youth. We were having lots of people come in and talk to us about what it meant to voice your rights and to speak up for it. I remember we had so many different guest speakers who came in and showed us how they incorporated justice into their art. And it put a lot of pressure on your own piece and your own exhibit. And so I remember feeling like so much pressure for it. But then I just was like, you know what? What is home to me? And Art First was home. It was home away from home and there was just so much love in it. And that's what I wanted to go off of. A lot of the people involved with Art Force Iowa at that time, the students were really looking to not only find home in the state or with their families, but also with their chosen families and through their artwork. I think that, that was really the expression. A lot of the things that were expressed through the artwork and the um, exhibition as a whole. Where is your home? Where do you feel safe and where do you feel like you're able to grow in your environment? And for me, that resonated well with me because growing up, you know, grew up very poor as a, also an immigrant. Art was a way for me to find my own path. And that's how I felt at home is when I was working on my art, practicing, you know, going out after school, in high school, doing photography, just messing around with the cameras however I could. For me, that became very thematic throughout my life. And I like that we came up with that theme for our, the exhibit as well. It was done at the Heritage Gallery, which I think is a wonderful space. We were able to really mess around with like big artworks there, like uh, large media. I think a lot of the kids really enjoyed it. I saw a lot of good work there. I saw a lot of very creative pieces. Um, that I would never have imagined myself. So I, it's great also to find inspiration from these kids as well, because every artist is different. And especially budding artists who don't really know the rules and don't aren't constricted by, you know, what other people are gonna think about their art. So seeing that develop in them was very beautiful. That No Justice Finding Home was the first multimedia exhibit uh, that Art Force Iowa really did. No Justice Finding Home really highlighted photo, video, audio, um, and of course, we still had visual elements. I've never done an exhibit before like that. You know, the exhibits that I have done were very small, more like a arts corner, like farmer's market kind of thing. This was like a grand, like a almost professional exhibit. So leading up to it, it was, it was stressful. Finding material, finding pieces that I felt deserved to be seen by a large group of people. But once the show came to be, all that stress faded away and you could see uh, the joy in the kids' faces seeing their art displayed in such a way. 
So it made it all worth it. Uh, listening stations were a multimedia display of some of the youth artists' songwriting work. Uh, at the time, there were several young people writing their own songs, writing their own lyrics, writing their own chord progressions, and rap music, working on their own beats. I helped facilitate not only like the youth artists being able to perform their songs in the space, but then to have the songs continue to live in the gallery after that. So iPods that we would mount on the wall, headphone splitters so cool people could listen to the same song by one youth artist on repeat, and there were multiple listening stations, and these listening stations would also display like the lyrics or any other um, essential components of the, the youth artist songwriting. Just being in front of everybody, that was super nervous, like nerve wracking. I didn't, I truly didn't expect everybody to show out for us the way they did. At all the events we were at, it was packed, like full house. People were dressed up really nice. But at the end of the day, that was my art and that was something that I was proud of. And I just wanted everybody else to be proud of it too. And I guess that was the only thing I was really, really nervous about. I remember a few pieces, there was a broken art, a broken glass display. The way it was laid out, the composition of it, you could tell it had been really thought out and very colorful, very emotive. Uh, I think that one really spoke to me as well. Obviously there's a lot of great paintings there as, you know, as well. Um, even one video. I think it was like really cool to be able to create a video with someone who is so talented. Just looking back on the film, I never would have thought that I would be able to do something like that or just like even create a story. I worked with the kids um, on making a film and I kind of taught them the real basics of filmmaking. Filmmaking is not just a visual thing, there's also the storytelling element. And I remember there was one kid, we sat there and filmed with him for like 45 minutes, camera on him. Kind of like nonsensical conversation until I think about the 30 minute mark. He kind of broke and he said, my dad tried to kill my mom. And it was this moment that I feel like that like sums up documentary filmmaking when you are capturing, trying to capture and capture and capture and you're like, you're waiting for something and then naturally it comes out. It, there was no like pressure on him to tell this story. He just, it's like all of a sudden he became comfortable enough to talk about it and no one was shocked, no one showed any type of reaction to it, but we were all just there to listen to him. And I, I, I felt like the kids that were there to learn the filmmaking aspect picked up on that right away. The video was also like really meaningful looking back. I feel like there's a lot of domestic abuse. It shows that like there are like organization and places like Our Force Iowa that you can just go to and feel at home without like having to put up with the consequences at home. I don't necessarily think I'm a, a, a good teacher at things. I like to just give them enough to figure out how to make something happen and then let them make it happen themselves. So that could be as simple when it comes to like the visual part of filmmaking. This is how you focus. This is how you hit the button to take a picture. Otherwise, you figure it out. You figure out how to frame, you figure out how to capture a moment. Because I can't, I, I don't think anyone can really teach you that. I think you need to figure out instinct on your own. And then mixing it with the storytelling aspect of what's a good beat, what's having the patience for something to come out naturally versus interrogating someone. I was inspired to make that film because, um, especially with that storyline of domestic abuse, growing up, I feel like in my community, there has been a lot of domestic abuse um, within the household 
uh, where the mom or the dad are abusing their kids or just like um, the dad are abusing the family or the mom vice versa and I think like the children need like to know that there is a safe place out there in the community that can help them make them feel safe make them feel at home a place where they can just go to and feel themselves instead of have to, having to worry about like being beaten up at home or something like that. So Our Force Iowa is a place where I feel at home and can be myself. I don't think we actually had a script. I think we did this imp improv. We weren't going to actually show violence uh, or like fighting or anything, but we reenacted maybe something like if you were a, a kid and you were hearing your family fight, whether that be two parents, a parent and a partner, um, and hearing it, not physically seeing it, because you don't know everyone's past and you don't know everyone's story, I feel like we were trying to be as sensitive to PTSD and all those things. To recreate something that has to deal with domestic violence with, with a handful of kids that may have experienced that or may be refugees, you are definitely walking a thin line of creating more emotional stress. So I feel like the way we did it was it became more of an art project. We did shoot around the neighborhood. I remember we drove around in the old Art Force van, RIP. When we got to the makeup part, I feel like I remember Tenny was very, he actually gave some direction on how, where the bruise should be. And if he was like, if I was hit, this is where it would be. I mean, it wouldn't be here, it would be up here, you know. When Christine was putting the makeup on, it was it was very intentional. The things I liked about that was, it was one of those things that I felt like very handcrafted. So the first time where um, I had my art display, it was really cool because I never think that like something like that would happen. I feel like that was only a few months in or like a year in a few months back I would would have just thought that I would be at home just you know doing nothing <laughs> so I think that it was really cool to have like um, a lot of people to just be there in the space where they can like look at your art and be like oh this is really cool I loved coming in there a even without the outside of the work that we did together seeing all the art that they had on the walls that they made, both their um, sculptures to paintings to drawings, and, and you see these things that are just so, like, heavy. You know, there was that one Ships in the Night painting that I, I th often think about. Usually when I'm using the phrase Ships in the Night, when I, there was someone I work with closely, but we don't see each other, and we literally will be, I'll be leaving, they'll be coming through. And I think about that painting whenever I, whenever that pops up. My philosophy when it comes to curating a show is really the belief that anything can be art if we say it is. In the interest of expression, sometimes we have to let go of perfection. The rough edges of the things we make often tells a much more interesting and perhaps truthful story than something that is more manicured. Curating as an art practice has always been a really powerful act. Assisting others in the art making process is revolutionary. And um, being in a community that is cultivating that has never uh, made me feel more fulfilled. Like my, my work at Art Force Iowa was some of the most fulfilling and rewarding work I've ever done. The greatest things you should take from No Justice are the people you meet. Absolutely the people you meet, like the relationships that I've made, the stories that I've heard, the art that I've created, I carry that all also just near and dear to me. Like every time I pass Virtual Cafe, I'm like, I had my first ever performance there. And just so many different, just people. I think networking, you never know. You never know who you'll meet, who you'll end up in the room with. Like you just never know. Keep in mind, like you're meeting really great people. You should learn from them and look at them and model after them. It's good people, so yeah.
This was the first exhibit that incorporated the voices of the youth in the HEROES program. It was amazing to see the gallery reflective of the studio space at Art Force Iowa, representing so many different lived experiences, different skill levels, and so many different points of view. Since 2016, Art Force Iowa has hosted a No Justice exhibit every year except 2020 due to the pandemic. Each year had a different theme, giving youth artists opportunities to explore, reflect, and create in response to the theme. As this series comes to an end, we want to honor where we have been, where we are, and where we are going. Every month leading up to our final exhibit, No Justice Legacies, we will be releasing a small documentary like this one to celebrate the legacy of this series. We invite you to be a part of this exhibit by sharing your story with us. If you're a creator, we want you to submit your story today. If you're not a creator, we're here to help. At Art Force Iowa, we believe we are the stories our community collects and we want to honor our collective heritage together. For more information, go to kjlegacy.org to find out how you can be a part of our legacy. Share your story today. My name is Jennifer Witt. I am a mom. Uh, I have a son, Abram, who is the best. I am an oncology nurse. I love um, being a part of patients' lives and getting to know them and being a witness to what they are going through and trying to find anything I can do to help um, just bring hope and be of hope to patients. I am also a wife of my husband, Colin. Colin Witt, he passed away in February of 2020 um, after um, lymphoma, fighting lymphoma. He loved Art Force Iowa. <laughs> and he loved that youth could be seen as more than any mistake they ever made or the bad things that had been done to them and he valued the way in which Art Force could, could not only help kids find their voice, but affirm who they are and who they were capable of becoming and to help them heal through the trauma and again, find ways, positive ways that maybe they didn't even know themselves that they would be good at or would be interested in to again, just find ways to heal and give voice to the trauma that they've been through, but also to start that process of healing and find hope and to know that maybe where they're at now does not define who they're going to be or who they can be in the future. Colin was this bigger than life figure and he meant so many things to so many people. Colin lived so intentionally and he lived out loud. He wore crazy socks, he was goofy, he was kind and he was lovely and he cared deeply about other people. And that's really his legacy. He loved getting to know people and beyond surface, he loved fellowship, he loved to mentor, he loved to shepherd young men and um, he loved to just help people find a way through whatever that was, whether that was basketball, whether that was in his courtroom, he believed that together we are each other's harvest, right? He felt that his role as a juvenile court judge um, was sacred and it was noble work. And it was about, it really was ultimately about problem solving. How do we come together? How do we make the justice system fair and accessible? But how can we also show mercy and be kind and honor each other's dignity. Make it a place where let's just sit down and talk and let's learn about each other and let's find out how we can get from A to B and beyond. Colin dove for second chances. Colin dove for the underdog. Colin dove for any opportunity where people could come together and collaborate. And then it wasn't just about that. He wanted to honor and raise up those people, whether it was the social workers or the JCOs or community um, uh, partners like Art Force who could find a way in a positive way, in an innovative way to say, how can we help kids? How can we help each other? Um, how can we help people move again from this place of darkness to a place of light and hope? And Colin, 
was that. He, he lived his values. He lived his faith steadfastly. He was humble and he was kind and he was big and goofy and funny and he was ours and uh, we love him very much. He had a piece of artwork. It was a beautiful, um, I think it was a photo that a, a, a young person had taken almost like at twilight and it's a bird. It, it's a beautiful picture and he had it framed. It's in the courthouse. He loved when kids would share about the things they loved, whether it was art or photos or the books. As he got to know kids in his courtroom or their families, Again, it wasn't about their case. These were not kids who were labeled in his mind. It was, tell me who you are. What matters to you? What do you hope to achieve here? But what about big picture questions? When the youth's art and or words are displayed, I just think it, it affirms A and validates where they are, where they've been, who they are, and also um, the empathy that it creates in others and the deeper understanding, if we're willing to be curious. And that was something Colin was so intentional about, was how do we, we have to be curious because we have to care. Any way he could honor the kids who created those pieces and let them know, hey, you matter, your work matters, your voice matters, to see it, especially in this space that can be so adversarial and us against them. He tried very hard in everything he did that things were never an us against them. I think the most simplest way that people can honor Colin's legacy is he persisted in love. He would see darkness every day, but he also saw yeah. such light and he tried to be that to others to be kind, that's it. it. It's that simple actually, and sadly it's that hard, but to just be kind to one another, to make space for one another. He persisted in love. Colin believed in second chances, and he believed in redemption and healing and hope, and he believed in his heart of hearts that again, you are not defined and you should not believe in the lie or the label that's been placed on you for whatever reason, or even if it's your own choosing at this moment, but your worst thing does not define who you are and that you are, you are capable of so much more if you're willing to put in the work and you're willing to believe it. When, after Colin passed away, there was a um, prayer that was sent to me and it, is, it has always stuck with me to be the things that we loved about Colin, right? So to be, to give his love away. And I think that's how we will continue to honor him, to continue to do good anyway, even when it's hard, to continue to show up for each other, even when it's hard or inconvenient, to continue to just listen and bear witness to, and to, to do the hard things and to do hard better. It, the story can't end there. It's too big and it's too, um, it, it doesn't end. Um, that light is still here. His love remains everywhere in so many wonderful ways. And I really, I like to call it our love giving away project. Our cornerstone with Restoring Hope was again, how do we, how can we again serve within the juvenile court system? So one of the things again that was so important to Colin was books. He loved to read. He loved to share books and poetry with kids. Reading opens not only uh, to adventure, and curiosity, but it, it allows you to better understand the lived experience of someone else and to gain a different perspective and to um, grow in your ability to be empathetic and to see uh, a world that maybe is very different than your own, but to see, bear witness to the humanity of others, right? And so it just mattered to us that books had to be a part of it. Restoring Hope allowed us to start the Mighty Oaks Giving Libraries. And we have one in each of the juvenile courtrooms at, at Polk County, and then also at the Drake Legal Clinic. And we've also been able, we've been blessed, um, two other judges, one in Northeast Iowa and one in Southeast Iowa, who both cover about five counties um, of outreach of juvenile work. They, these are books that they can freely give. 
youth can pick them out. They can be given as an award, kind of to recognize how hard they've been working or progress towards their goals, adoptions. They've also just been there to kind of help people connect with one another. And what's been neat to see is that the judges will talk with them about the books and the kids will not really give a book report, but they'll talk about what it meant to them. And what we've tried very hard to do is curate books that really reflect who the youth is. What are their experiences, who they are, the issues and that they truly face. Um, but there's always a level of how they can heal. And, and face adversity and be transformed through this process. That again, they don't have to be defined by what brought them into juvenile court, but it's more important about who they're going to become and what they're capable of becoming. And so books are taken, I know by like the juvenile court officers, they share them at the shelters, at the detention centers. Feedback we've gotten is just how important they, the kids feel seen, they feel heard, and it's allowed for connections that maybe couldn't have happened or didn't wouldn't have happened so maybe organically um, and helps the teams grow. The other piece of Restoring Hope then is how do we then honor and help in whatever way we can and, and collaborate with community organizations like Art Force Iowa that are supporting the work done in juvenile court and helping these kids again to find their voice, to heal, and to, to, to find hope in uh, who they can become moving forward. ตัวเลยเจอตามุลาลอเปอร์ทอยกะเฮตาสกตอลเลลเซเซดิทอยกะเนบะเรปเปอร์ทูยูวาตะนอนอกะปาเซเวดายาเคกะยิกะนายเต